I'm on a 2019 standard Windows server and I'm going to install Internet Information Services. I'm going to start by clicking on Add Roles and Features in the Server Manager Dashboard. And in Add Roles and Features, we're going to get a wizard. We'll just click Next. Choose the Role-Based or Feature-Based Installation option, which is the default. And then click Next on the name of the server that you want to select. And now we want to click on the box that says Web Server IIS. Make sure you check the box that says Add Features when prompted and then click Next. Here are additional features you can install if you'd like, but you can ignore it if you're just trying to install Internet Information Services. When I click Next a couple more times, then I'm listed with what's called Role Services. So what's interesting about Windows Server is that you have roles and features that you can install, but sub-roles are called Role Services. So in this case, Web Server is the one that's highlighted. That's the server role. Everything underneath it is considered a role service. And by default, it has everything it needs to do basic uh, IIS management and web server installation. I also like to add a few things myself, but you don't have to do that, such as HTTP redirection. And I'll be doing a video that shows how to use that coming up. I'll also be doing a video on basic authentication and Windows authentication. If you're planning on installing FTP server, then you also need to make sure all of the management tools are installed as well. And I'll click Next. And then down the bottom right, I'll click Install. And it usually takes just a couple of minutes to install based on the speed of your server. In this particular case, I'm using a virtual machine running on a Windows Server host. But of course, this works the exact same way when you run it on a physical computer. The installation is complete. I'll click Close. And now in the Tools menu at the top, you'll see something new, and it's called Internet Information Services Manager. I'm going to expand IIS Manager until we see the default website, which it automatically creates. And there it is. It also has something called application pools. Now you don't typically have to mess with this, but the more additional role services you add, the more application pools you'll see in here. Sometimes you'll need to restart them or stop them, recycle them in this particular case, but uh, most of the time you don't need really need to do anything with them. Under default website, we have many different icons for configuration. But before we do that, let's just open up our web browser and just confirm that our web server is working. So we can type in either the IP address or we can type in the name of the server. So I'm going to put in the name of the server. First HTTP colon slash slash file server two. And there we see the default page for Internet Information Services. So we know that this is working. Now if we click on the default document, I'll double click on it, we can see default.htm is the very first page that shows up. If it can't find default.htm, it'll go down to default.asp. If it can't find that, it'll go down to the next one and the next one. The reason that index.htm and HTML type pages are in there is because Linux and Unix uses those, and a lot of programs that create websites for you will use those as their default pages. So they added those, I believe, in Windows 2008. I'm going to go back to the default website, and now we're going to look at the directory and where it's pulling that default document. So if I go off to the right where it says Basic Settings, we can see that it's pulling the document from the system drive, and that's going to be your C drive by default, followed by INET Pub and www root. So if I go into File Explorer, click on this PC, double click on the C drive, then I can go to INET Pub and then www root. 
And all we see here is the IIS start page. So all those other pages that are in the list don't exist, which is really interesting. So if I cancel the location of the directory, and I go back to the default document, we see the IIS start page. It's in the list, but it's at the very bottom. We also see a warning at the top that says the IIS start.htm exists in the current directory, which is that www root directory, and it's recommending you move it to the top. So why is it recommending that? It's because these other documents don't exist. So if you move this one to the top, then it will get to that page much more quickly. So we'll just click on the move up link on the right hand side. And we'll just keep moving it up until it gets to the top. Let's just make sure that our website still works OK. So I'll right click and choose Refresh, and it still does. I'm going to go back to the default website. And I'm just going to go through some of these icons that you may want to make changes to or at least understand what they are. So if I start with authentication, I'll double click on that. We can see the reason we're getting in without any kind of login is because we're choosing anonymous authentication. We don't use basic or Windows or ASP impersonation type of authentication. And that's why we can get in without any kind of username and password. In an upcoming video, I'm going to show you how to use basic and Windows authentication and we'll turn anonymous authentication off. Now, one thing that Google and some of the other companies have done is they've said, hey, if you don't have a certificate, then if anybody goes to your website, then it's gonna show up as an untrusted site. So we'll need to also set up SSL as well. So in this case, it says that we're not requiring secure sockets layer. However, if we go to the root here of the server, we can see an option for server certificate. So some of these icons are gonna look the same. Authentication here is the same as it is in the default website. Default document is the same here as it is in the default website. But some of these icons are in addition, and that's because they provide other features and functions such as FTP, as you see along the top. So what we really need to be concerned about here is server certificates. That's really the last thing we really need to worry about at this time. So we can see if we double click on server certificates that we've got three certificates already installed, but all of these certificates are basically self-signed or server signed certificates. They're not public types of certificates. So we need to do what's called uh, create a certificate request. So if we click on create a certificate request, then we can put in our common name, organization, et cetera. So I'm going to be doing an, a video on this on how to do a public certificate request as well as a self-signed certificate request. So take a look for that video. I will walk you through it and then you'll be able to assign a certificate. So if I click back on the default website and go to bindings, then we see the only thing that's bound right now is HTTP port 80, and that is now considered an untrusted port because everyone's now going to HTTPS, which is using the certificate, using SSLs or secure socket layer. So I'll click on add, and I'll click on the type and change that to HTTPS. So now we can see the port jumped from 80 to 443 because that's the port that SSL certificates use. So whatever the name of your website is, you'll need to type it in. It's got to match the name of the certificate. So let's say that the name of my certificate and my website is going to be techpublishing.com. We no longer need to put in the www because most people don't use that anymore. You also may have a host name that has another subdomain name in front of it, such as mail, for instance, or you could have it sales dot whatever your domain is. But your certificate has to be that exact thing, unless you get something called a wildcard certificate that allows you to have as many different subdomain names as you want. All right, so now that we've got our certificate name our, is now also matching our host name, and we've got our type set to HTTPS and the port to set to uh, 443, we need to select a certificate. Now, in the upcoming video, you're going to see the certificate creation process, and you'll see that certificate in this list. But for now, I'm just gonna click on one of the certificates that you see here. We'll click on view just to see what it looks like. And we can see that it is a self-signed certificate. It's issued by the server. If it was a public certificate, you'd see it was issued by something like uh, GoDaddy or Network Solutions, something like that. 
So I'm going to click on OK, and it says the binding is already being used. You sure you want to do that? Well, just for this demonstration, we'll say yes. And click Close. Now I'm going to go back to my web browser, and I'm going to add HTTPS instead of just HTTP. Hit Enter. And now it says it's not secure. And the reason it says it's not secure is because it's not a public or trusted certificate. So I'll click on More Information. Go to the web page anyway. And it says, hey, you're going to get an error. So you've got to have your certificate trusted, or you've got to have a, a public certificate, one of those two, in order to get it to work right in the default browser. Now, Chrome and Firefox, they may still work. They'll just give you a warning about it. Now, we do want to change our web page because this web page is just a basic starting uh, point for a web page. So I'm just going to create a fake web page here and I'm going to create a new text document. You're probably going to want to use some sort of program to create it. And I'm going to call this one. I'll just call it new. Now it's a TXT file. And the reason I know that is because if I click on view, I'll click on file name extensions and you see it adds the .txt. So it was a .txt file the whole time. It was just hiding that information. Now I'm going to double click on this and I'm going to say this is my website. And I'm going to close it, save it. And now I'm going to rename it. Instead of being .txt, I'm going to say it's .html. It's going to say, you sure you want to do that? Yes, I am. And now it changes so you can see the E for the web browser. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into my default document. And I'm going to add a new page, and I'm going to call it new.html. Like I said, you're going to have a much fancier page because you're going to be creating one from a program or you're going to be hiring somebody to do this. So now I've got my new.html, and it's my default document. It's at the top. Whichever one's at the top, it's going to try to go to first. I'll go back to my web browser, and I'm going to say HTTP because, you know, we don't have the certificate set up right yet. And I'm going to say File Server 2. Let's see if it pulls up that new document I just created. And there it is. It says, this is my website. Not fancy, but it does show you how to set up that basic website uh, in Internet Information Services after you install the IIS server role and all the role services that go with it. So that is a basic overview of how to configure your web server in a Windows 2019 server.